Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Talk Math with your friends. It is my pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Abigail Burnett. She's a post back at Iowa State University, and today she'll be speaking about sculptures of dot diagrams. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Abigail Burnett. Hello, everyone. Um, so can I have permission to share a file in the chat, please? I don't think I have that ability right now. Um, I do have all of my references and my speaker notes on a Word doc. So if you wanted to follow along that way, if I can make that available, that would probably be the easiest way. But otherwise, I can just post it online later um, since that button does not appear to be working for me today. But that's OK. We'll try You're and figure something out. You're okay. co-host now. You should be able to do it. Oh, OK. It is still not feeling it, so I'll deal with it later. Um, if you can email it to me, I can come up with something else to do or. Let's just go ahead and do that afterward and maybe post it with the abstract right. or the recording. That's, That's great. Sorry, there you go. The, the best use of our time. Ooh, wrong button. I swear I labeled myself as a Zoom expert and I've messed up three things so far, but that's okay. All right, hello, good morning. Welcome to my talk. Um, uh, let me get the chat going, great. So I'm gonna talk to you about an art project that I've been working on for, for the past academic year. Um, and, and when I say I'm gonna talk to you about an art, art project, uh, I mean that I'm gonna talk about a lot of things that are tangential to that art project and that build up and, and build up the context around the sculptures that I've actually created. Um, so before I, I leap into that, I do have a couple of thanks to give. First of all, um, the funding for the materials in these sculptures was provided by the Focused Artist Grant Program at Iowa State University. Um, so thanks to them that I was able to actually afford wire and, and sculptural materials and studio time to make these, um, as well as my advisor, Dr. Herzog, who signed off on this project after knowing me for less than a month. So shout out to him for taking that chance on me. I think it worked out well for both of us. Um, and then thank you everyone for being here. Um, there are a lot of names on the participant list that are like Twitter famous and I'm a little bit starstruck to be talking in front of all of you, uh, but, but I'm very glad to have you. Um, with that though, I also have a couple of, of disclaimers to make. Um, the first being that the only story that I'm an expert in is my own. So uh, a big part of art and culture is that it's very intersectional. Um, I'm going to be talking about inspiration that I receive from communities to which I do not belong. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do my best to do so in a respectful way. And the reference link that I'll make available later has references that link to other specific artists. Um, but I just want to say that I'm not an expert on, on any history other than my own. And I don't want to, to come across as taking ownership of ideas that don't belong to me. Um, I also want to say that because Again, it's an art talk as well as a math talk. Um, there, there are implicit injustices and, and stories of loss that are built into the fabric of what I do. Um, so those will come up as we go through this. And I just want you to be aware of that before I put them on the screen. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others, please. Um, yeah, that's about it for that. So first big idea, and I'd love to see some, some thoughts in the chat or perhaps unmute yourself here. The, the big idea is that we don't do math in a vacuum. So when I say that, there, there are ideas that surround what we choose to do as mathematicians, as artists, as people who are math adjacent. So I'd love to hear some thoughts about what that means to you and to your work. Um, just throw some ideas around in the chat there. I kind of like thinking the idea that math is all interconnected and that you can't just isolate one part of it. There will always be other things that come in and play in and based on other things, which is kind of the thing that's beautiful about math. Yeah, totally. Thanks. I think that was Evan. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah he should be a math major. <laughs> oh boy, then I have some news for you. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's very difficult to think without air. Yeah, hot take. Um, and I'm already seeing like some some ideas for activities that I'm gonna have to look up later as well. So yeah, so the, the context of the work that we do 
I would say is not just the context of the math itself, but also the context of the space in which we do it. Um, we need to have a sense of what kinds of, yes, exactly, the questions that we find in, interesting are functions of society. I think that's probably the, the tidiest way to put it. But, but the way that we engage with our own research and the way that we engage with our own learning is informed in large part by the history that, that has led us to this moment, um, by all of the discoveries that came before us, by all the individuals that came before us. And in this specific case, also in all of the artwork that already exists around knots and knot theory, um, because there's quite a lot of it. Um, and then on top of that, we have to think about who our audience is and the actual setting and place in which we're doing this work. Um, so I'll talk about each of these things roughly in this order, um, history, um, history, setting and impact, all of which sort of come together to, to create a space where we can interact with math as a creative discipline. So that's our objective for today. First, we're going to think about math and math history as, as a tool of discovery. Um, and if not, there, there, there's a relationship between math and art that may not be exactly a bijection, but which is certainly very tightly connected. Um, so we're going to talk about what that relationship has looked like in certain contexts throughout history. Um, and then we're gonna talk about how those have informed the work that I do in creating this series of sculptures. Um, and like I said, I am not the first person to make beautiful knots. Um, so in, these two are examples from the past 10 years um, of, of 3D printed knots and surfaces that have been uh, published in the Bridges Math Art Gallery, which is a wonderful publication full of cool math art. Um, and what you can see already is that there's beautiful work being done taking knot diagrams, which I promise to define in a minute, uh, and, and turning them into three-dimensional objects that we can explore in a more tactile way. Um, and the reason that this is important is because mathematical knot diagrams are about the most boring possible way to make math knots. Um, so let, let's start at the beginning because I've used a lot of words here that I haven't defined very nicely. Um, so what do I mean when I say a knot? So take yourself a piece of string, tangle it all up however much you want, and glue the ends back together so that there's no beginning or end. This tangled ball of string is now what a mathematician would call a knot. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a simple, we say simple because it's not spliced, there are no holes in it. It's just a closed curve that's been tangled up with itself and then reconnected so that you can go around it forever and, and have no sense of beginning or end. Um, it's made of one line, and we usually draw them exactly how you see on the screen in these knot diagrams, which are typically simple pencil drawings um, or, or just black line drawings where you have that sense of crossing wherever the strand appears to go over or under itself. But if you said the word knot to someone who has never looked at a topology book, that is not what they would have in mind. You might think of your shoelace or you might think of something like this image here from the Book of Kells, uh, where it's a very complicated sort of tangled up pattern or design. So when I say knot, and I'm I end up kind of using these words really loosely because a knot to a mathematician means the simple closed contour, but knot work in general can be much more complicated. Um, and I can see people leaning into their cameras trying to figure out if the, the tangle in that Book of Kells image is actually a knot, and I will tell you it's not. It's actually two knots that have been linked together. So if you were to sit here for an hour and trace it with your eyeballs or with the tip of a pencil, you would find two disconnected curves that have been woven together. <laughs> Those tricky knot thank knots is right. Thank you for answering that question. <laughs> Yes, so it is a link. Um, I'm not gonna talk about links very much, but, but a link is just when you have more than one knot that are stuck together. So let, let's take a little bit of a walk. <laughs> let's take a little bit of a walk through the, the Western history of knot theory as a mathematics. So the, it roughly begins in, the European history of knot theory as a math roughly begins with da Vinci, who drew this very big, very complicated monolinear curve that I'll show you a picture of in a minute. 
Um, and while he wasn't strictly a mathematician, it, it put monolinear curve drawings, monolinear meaning one line, so these sort of knotted patterns, it put that on the map for people who were interested in scientific and math research. Um, from there, we have a gap of a couple hundred years, as things tend to be in math. Um, and, and then we finally have a word for this. We, we name this the geometry of place or the geometry of position. And it's important to give things names because then you can talk about them. Um, and, and by the geometry of, of place, we were thinking it doesn't super matter whether my shape has straight edges or curved edges, but it matters whether it's got holes in it. It matters whether it's made of one piece or two that are disconnected. That's the sort of questions that we were starting to ask. Um, Euler said, well, you know what, you know what's relevant to that? Graph theory. Um, and with the, the bridges of Kohlensberg problem, uh, he said, well, it doesn't super matter to me what exactly the shapes of my landmass look like. It matters to me how many bridges there are connecting them. And again, promise to show a picture in a hot second. Um, it took until about the 1770s for people to connect what da Vinci had drawn to these things that Leibniz and Euler were talking about, this geometry of position, and actually say, well, wait a second, um, these, are, these are connected. These are the same idea. And he was inspired, for the record, Vandermond was a violinist. So uh, once again, we have art finding its way sneakily into our math talk. Um, but he was inspired by craftsmen and watching them braid, uh, braid nets to catch fish with. Um, because it didn't super matter how long your string was, it mattered whether your knot would come undone. And so that was, so that was the connection that he made between Leibniz's geometry of position um, and, and knot theory and what that would become. So then we bounce ahead to the 1830s and Gauss, who was studying the electromagnetism of volcanoes, um, gave us our first knot theory proof, which is I promised there wouldn't be a lot of links here, but it was a linking question. Uh, he proved that two circles which are separated from each other are different from two circles which are stuck together or linked together. Um, and then one of his students, Johann Benedict Listing, uh, came up with the word topology. And this timeline is a little bit of a lie. Um, 1847 was the first year where topology was written in a paper, um, but he had used the word previously in correspondence in the 1830s, but I haven't been able to really pin down a, a first usage in correspondence. So many knots in the electromagnetism of volcanoes. And I will plug one of the references here. There's a great paper by Aaron Kohlberg, um, who wrote a beautiful paper that outlines all of this stuff in way more detail than I could possibly have time for. Um, and, and that paper talks a lot about what Gauss was doing and why knots came up. Um, and before I, I jump off this timeline, I'm gonna get up on my soapbox for a minute. Johann Benedict Listing invented the Mobius strip. He came up with it six months before Mobius did. He studied surfaces like the Mobius strip for the rest of his life. Mobius ran off and did some astronomy stuff. We should call it a listing strip. I call it a listing strip and I encourage you all to do the same. This is, this is my soapbox. I will stand on it for as long as it takes. <laughs> okay, here's some pictures. Um, that first one is, is, a cur is the, the monolinear curve I described by da Vinci. And once again, I will save you the trouble. I have sat there and traced it all out. It is one line. Um, <laughs> um, and I actually don't know what the Latin in the middle there says, but maybe somebody else knows more than I do about that. But you can see right there, we have a scientist drawing knots on, on a board, uh, which gets us to event where we are today with mathematicians drawing knots on boards. Um, and then we have this bridges question. So, so the bridges of Kohlensberg, can you traverse every bridge exactly once and get back to the same landmass where you began? Um, um, but it doesn't super matter whether this landmass in the middle is square or circular. All it matters is that it's there and that it's not connected to the rest of them. And then, like I said, this first ever not theory proof that we have written down in, in a Western math document, um, 
these two circles in the top box are not the same as the two circles in the bottom because they are not, they don't intersect one another. They can come apart. Um, and this proved something about the direction of a magnetic field affecting a, a wire that was passing through both of those loops. So I think it's pretty cool that something that I can draw in two seconds with a galaxy print pen uh, was such an important and deep result to the physicists. And then that is a listing strip at the very end. <laughs> I'm telling you, I will, the rest of my life, I'm gonna be calling that a listing strip and I'm gonna be getting weird looks and it's gonna be worth it. Um, what is a galaxy print pen? Good question. Um, so in Microsoft, the, the little pen drawing tool, you have the option to make it draw in galaxy print, which is a really fun effect. It doesn't work in OneNote if you have the latest version, but it works everywhere else for some reason. It's great. I love it. It comes up again today. Um, and then someone else talked about computing the, the Alexander polynomial of that first drawing. So Alexander polynomials are a type of knot invariant, which means they're a tool that we can use to tell whether two knots are the same. I will tell you that if you look at a bigger picture of this, it's actually really clear that you can untangle it quite a lot. Um, in addition to the symmetry, there are a lot of places where one strand just goes over and over and over and over back and forth. And so you could untangle that without breaking the circle. Um, so it's actually probably a lot simpler than it looks, but it's still a big complicated freaking knot. Okay, so I just threw a whole lot of history facts at you. Um, so let's just take a moment and think about where else you use visualizations in the math that you do. Uh, and I will just shut up for a minute. Is that a rhetorical question or do you want us to answer? I actually want answers, yes. Ooh, I use visualizations. My research is around periodic numbers and to think about a geometric schematic of, of QP or the periodic numbers um, is has to be a visualization and it's not rooted in Euclidean space. That sounds very hard. Many, many of my number theory students just went through this on Wednesday and are in the audience right now. Yep. Yeah, I'm seeing graph theory as well. Um, that's another place. Diagrams for commutative algebra. Phase diagrams. For differential you know where, equations, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. You know where else we use visualizations in math? When we teach third graders how to multiply and divide. You know, even as something as simple as, all right, draw 10 objects and now split, circle them into to two equal groups, right? Visualizations in math go hand in hand from the very freaking beginning, which is super cool. How many watermelons? Yeah, drawing 50 watermelons on your page and trying to break them into five equal shopping carts. <laughs> Always a good time. So. Yeah, see, almost everybody seems to have an example where they have had to draw something to do their math, which I think is super cool. I'm gonna find my place in my notes, so keep thinking of things. Cool. So, here is our first foray into my actual sculpture work. And I think it's very silly that my original stated goal of this project was to pull knot diagrams off the page. And now I am showing them to you on a screen. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the context of a, a remote program makes it very hard for me to pass around the sculptures for you all to hold in your hands. So you just have to hope that I picked a really good angle to take the pictures from. Um, but, but these sculptures, I choose these to be the first ones I show you because the story behind how I chose to organize them is very, very directly related to the timeline that I just showed you. So I picked um, knots that I thought were kind of cool looking um, and I embellished them with these copper coils to reference back to those original ele electromagnetism experiments. So what these sculptures are doing it is very explicitly taking that story of the de development of knot theory as a discipline, 
and turning it into something you can hold in your hand, um, which I think is very, very cool. And, and also brings math to life in a way that a diagram cannot, right? Um, so, so that was the original concept. Here's some more in that same vein. A lot of people have seen the trefoil knot before. So I took the trefoil and I spent a very, very long time knotting copper wire around it. And, and the knot of the copper wire, if you were to, to pause every couple of loops, would actually be exactly the same as the trefoil knot. If you were to pause, clip it, glue the ends together. So I just took that same repeating pattern over and over and over again, looped it around the outside. Are any of the coils non-trivial satellites? I don't know what that means. Um, and, and this might be a good opportunity to say that I've never taken a topology class. <laughs> this is entirely a passion project. I said no links. Ah, so these are not links um, because the ends of the copper wire are not actually connected. Um, they, they just magically end in the void somewhere and are tucked away and hopefully nobody notices or gets pricked by them. Yeah, no, I have no idea what a, a satellite is, but it sounds very cool. Um, and maybe if the ends were connected, it sounds like that would be relevant to what you're saying. But, but I'm afraid I don't know enough to answer that really. I thought it looked like dragon scales and that is why I did it this way. <laughs> um, and, and so th this is a, a natural transition um, is that I was kind of at this point in, in developing these sculptures, I was kind of goofing off. Um, a, a big story of my life in math is that I was kind of goofing off and then something happened. And, and this is an example of it is I, I had these, this history, I thought it was cool, I was ready to do something fun with it and then move on. Um, and, and then things changed. Um, and, and the thing that changed was very suddenly within about a week of each other, um, two very important people in my life passed away. Um, the first being Mr. Paul Fierro, my high school physics and science teacher, my high school physics teacher, mentor, and, and very good friend, um, lost his battle with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And then about a week later, my grandmother also passed. And so there I was in Iowa, far away from all of my friends and family, dealing with these losses. And I really found myself looking for a way to take the story and those memories um, and turn them into something that I could share and that I could express myself with. And that gave rise to a, a complete paradigm shift that, that defined the rest of this sculpture series. And that is that instead of trying to tell mathematical stories with math, I was going to try to tell my own personal story using math as, as a tool to guide that. And in order to make that happen, I started to look for other examples of, of math and art intersecting. Um, and so I'm sure right now you, you have some images in your head. I showed you one earlier from the Book of Kells. Um, lots of people have seen examples of, of knots in art. Um, take a minute, think about where you might've seen that, can answer or just keep it in your head, but, but I'll give you a moment to, to try to predict where we're going here. And this, this first picture, and, and the reason I was confident that this was possible it is because this picture, this etching of the tree of life actually appears in a knot theory textbook, Rolfson's Knots and Links. Uh, and so that gave me hope that I had set myself a possible task. And so I went searching through history and uh, Dr. Polson there has, knows that I had seen some of this before in his uh, history of math class. Knots appear throughout history in our artwork. So completely divorcing ourselves from the math story now, we look for those examples. And here is probably the earliest one that we still have surviving. Uh, it's a piece of work from 2500 BC that shows a, oh my goodness, I'm so glad that somebody knows the real words for these. I just call it the circle, the circle weedy thing. <laughs> um, so we see this pattern, it's a snake that's been woven among itself. And yes, everything on the screen right now is exactly one line. 
Um, and, and so we can go back as far as we want and find these patterns. Um, probably the most familiar to me when I started this project was Celtic knotwork. Um, because I do have, have a family history, uh, a family culture in, that stems from Scotland and Ireland. And so I had kind of seen these patterns before and I, I knew what to Google to find them. Um, <laughs> yes, there's a ton of stuff all throughout Western Europe, um, especially when we get into illuminated manuscripts. So here are some examples. Um, in this case, uh, the one on the left, all of the green is connected, all of the red is connected, all of the yellow is connected. The one in the right is a little more faded, a little hard to see, but we still have these very intricate woven patterns. And one that actually really caught my eye was, was this French book. Um, it's a French hymnal book, and this capital letter G is a very, very tangled up goose. Um, and, and here I need to shout out to the Iowa State University librarians who were able to find me this picture. Um, I had this image, but I had no source from it for it. It was from Pinterest and the link site was a, a phishing scam. So thanks to the librarians for actually finding me a legitimate resource on it. Um, and I really liked how explicitly um, the knots are visible in this. And so that inspired me to turn those very explicit shapes that were sort of elongated along the goose's neck into jewelry. Um, and for, for those of you who don't know me, my background before I decided to become a mathematician, before I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer, was that I wanted to be a jewelry artist when I was little. Um, so here was an opportunity to take that earlier passion and, and highlight a really cool piece of history. Um, so these two knots are, are actually the same knot, um, but one of them is a bracelet and one of them is a pendant. So if you were to reach into the galaxy on the left and stretch it out, assuming that the wire were infinitely not brittle and infinitely stretchable and wouldn't shatter if you yanked on it too hard, you could eventually stretch it and deform it to get back to the galaxy, to turn the hole that is filled with galaxy on the left into the hole that's filled with galaxy on the right. Um, and so these two go together because they are the same knot, um, but, but they're inspired by that original piece of, of art history. Um, and I just think that's the dang coolest thing. Another place that I found knots in, and I think someone mentioned puzzle grids um, for drawing symmetrical Celtic designs. Um, the, the Chakwe people, primarily from the northeastern region of Angola, take that to, I think, a whole different level. Um, so this is a community that uses these symmetrical mirror curves, these symmetrical drawings, as part of how they tell their oral histories. Um, so you draw out the grid in the sand, you see the little dots on the left, and then as someone is telling a story, they're tracing that line. And they're generally only one line for the entire story. They can get far more elaborate than this. You can have different figures connected to one another in, in long streams. And all of these are used to tell both oral histories as, as well as more, more deep cultural stories. Um, and it's part of community building. Um, to sit around and, and watch and listen to these stories be told and have these knots drawn out in the sand as they're being told. Um, and so from that, I said, well, mirror curves are really cool, but that had like a gazillion crossings in it. There's no way I can even try to replicate it, so I shouldn't. And instead I took the, the simplest mirror curve, which is the seven four knot. So it's the fourth knot with seven crossings and it's on a three by two grid. And so I took that knot and rather than try to duplicate this history that already exists in this culture, um, I, I found an opportunity to give myself a little hug. So when I look at this, it looks like a person hugging someone else or maybe a stuffed animal or something because I've exaggerated, I've taken out that symmetry and traded it for a three-dimensional shape that, that relates more directly to what I was feeling when I made it. Does mirror curve mean that it can be deformed into something with one or more lines of symmetry? Um, sort of. So here I'm gonna defer again to uh, an artist that knows more about, or to an author that knows more about me. 
Um, there is a really great article um, in the Bridges uh, archive about symmetrical mirror curve drawings. Mirror curve means that it looks like this, that it was drawn on a grid. And the reason it's called a mirror curve is because it's as if you got to the border and you bounced off a mirror and reflected back into the grid. <laughs> Ooh, somebody just said this reminds me of Indian Rangoli. Guess what my next slide is. <laughs> Great timing. So, uh, like I said, the, these patterns appear around the world and through the ages, and this is actually a, a contemporary practice that's still ongoing, um, and that is actually has an active internet community on Tumblr um, of these, these designs called Colum or Rangoli, depending on the region. Um, and what they are, are, is, are these designs that are drawn typically either out of powdered minerals or, or rice flour, on the ground in front of a household or perhaps along a street for a larger celebration. And these patterns are very symmetrical, they're very woven, they're very intricate, um, and they are designed to be worn away throughout the day. Um, these patterns are passed down through, match through um, from mother to daughter to daughter and so on. Um, and they're typically drawn by the woman of the household. Um, again, I don't, Ha I've never actually seen one of these in person, but I, I've read about them. And what really struck me about it was twofold. First of all, the fact that this is a form of community building among the women, uh, specifically of a community. And the second being that they're designed to be impermanent. And thinking about that and then thinking about the loss of my grandmother reminded me of when I was very, very little and we were painting my bedroom. Um, and we painted these very beautiful like Peter Rabbit scenes all over it um, with, with butterflies and, and white picket fences and Peter Rabbit and bunnies all over the place. And so I took that idea of, of telling the stories that have been told to me by my grandmother and by my mother and I, I turned them into butterflies because those were the parts that I painted when I was little. Um, and I really connected with the idea that the patterns are meant to be worn away throughout the day in order to, to carry good luck and good fortune along on the soles of your feet. And so for that reason, these are the only ones that are not strictly mathematical knots because I did not solder the ends together. Um, I let them be loose in, in a recognition of, of that impermanence. Um, and I'm gonna take a minute and pause and collect myself now. <laughs> Okay, so the last story that I wanna tell you is actually going back to math history um, and, and specifically to the 1970s um, when we had these two knots, 1061 and 1062. So these are knots with 10 crossings. They were listed 161st and 162nd in the table. Um, and, and we said that they were different until this guy, Kenneth Perko, who was a master's student in math at the time and fun fact went on to become a lawyer instead, um, looked at these knots and said, wait a second, actually they're the same. And in doing so, he first of all found a counterexample to a conjecture that had been assumed to be true for over a hundred years. And second of all, he really messed up our knot tables because now these are the same. We can't tabulate them separately. And so in every single place where not tabulations had been listed out, we had to do something. We had to make a change because we had experienced the loss of this, this difference. Um, so, so different tables handle it in different ways. Um, the knot atlas, which is a, a wiki for knots, includes them both but puts a footnote. Some tables don't include the second one and renumber the entire remaining 160 some. Um, some put a footnote and don't include the second diagram. And, and I was reading this story and, and it really connected with me and to the idea of, of loss. And so this last knot here is in memorial to Mr. Fierro. Um, it's the Perco pair. So it's one knot that we called that we name a pair. Um, and to me, the story of, of losing him and having to constantly remind myself that he is no longer here 
and, and that I have to include that little footnote in my mind every time I think of happy memories of him really connected with this story of putting in little footnotes in our knot tables. Um, and so if you look at this from different angles, which I know is impossible because it's on a screen, um, there are variously several hearts and infinity signs that appear as you walk around it. Um, again, that idea of, of endurance is, I, I think, intrinsic to the fact of, to this knot and to the story of why we have this knot in our tables. So, I have given you a lot of stories. I have put a lot of ghosts into this project and they are all now sitting in a glass cabinet. And the question is, will these stories resonate with an audience? Um, here is what it looks like in the actual gallery. Um, it, it's a very small display. I, to me, a knot is something that you should be able to tie with your hands. So you should be able to hold it in your hands. And so all of these sculptures are no bigger than my palm. Um, and so I was really worried after pouring all these stories out that they wouldn't resonate with viewers. Um, so I forced the issue to find out and I made it extra credit for my class to go and look at them. Um, I, I, ma I made an extra credit assignment for my students. I'm, I'm a graduate student, so I, I teach a class and I made it an option to go to the gallery and reflect on any of the, the pieces that were in the gallery. So they could talk about mine or they could talk about something else that was in there that had resonated with them. Um, and my goal was to get them to just think about, first of all, to think about something other than math for a hot minute. Um, <laughs> and, and second, to, to get them to reflect on how what we were learning in class connected with their lived experiences. Um, and so 21 out of my 31 students actually wrote a reflection uh, and five of them responded to this project. And I just wanna sort of briefly highlight a couple of things they've said. So I, I've included some comments anonymously with their permission. Um, and the first was a student whose parents are Irish immigrants or, or, or have Irish background of some sort. And um, he said that in, in looking at the stories, he was able to connect his experience growing up with Celtic knotwork throughout, uh, throughout his home with this math that we were doing in class. Um, similarly, I had another student who is more artistic um, say that they were able to actually think about the math that went into the art that they did on their own. And so these are students who are not math majors, who are finding connections between topology, which is generally an upper level class, and their own lived experiences, which I think is something that's really cool. And in fact, one student looked at those butterflies and actually found joy from it. Um, and given that I've spent most of the semester trying to convince these students that math is fun, uh, <laughs> this was a big step. Um, so, so what can we say then? We, we've concluded that math can be not only the object of an artistic project, but it can also be a vehicle for expressing a broader story. Um, and when I stepped away from my initial reluctance to step outside of, of math and look for inspiration from, from places that were unfamiliar to me, I was able to add a lot of depth to the stories that I was choosing to tell um, and, and connect with people who had experiences other than my own. Um, and in doing this, I was able to share this passion that I have for mathematics with a community of people in a public gallery who normally would not intentionally seek out mathematics. Um, so my students are an obvious example, but this is a public gallery space that the project is sitting in. And so people from any background can go and connect with the stories that I've told here. Which leads me to my overarching conclusion here that math is beautiful. For those of you who have been keeping count, this is the 13th sculpture. Um, and, and I like this one to conclude with because there's there's not a big deep story here. Um, I let uh, Katie pick pick a knot, and she picked this one. And I I said, well, okay. And I just started making it on the fly without prototyping, and it came out to be this very spherical image. Um, and I call it a celestial sphere because it kind of reminds me of a comet um, traversing a path around a galaxy. Um, and, and there's no deep significance to that choice. That's just how it ended up looking. 
And I just think that's absolutely beautiful and, and super duper cool. So um, I encourage you going, going out from this moment to look for places where you can share your passions with new people and in new spaces, because I think that's something that talk math with your friends is really good at is making math accessible to other people who would like to talk math. And, and I challenge us all to step out and, and talk math with people who maybe don't want to, because I, I've proven to you now that that is very possible. So I'll end there uh, and open it up for questions. Thank you. Bet some people have some connections they'd like to share. Abigail, do you have long-term plans for the display of your pieces? Or I, I don't. Um, the exhibit ends um, next week and I don't have a, a couple of pieces I, I'm going to be gifting away, but for the most part, the, the collection as a whole will be living in a box until I come up with a better plan. What are your plans for next year, Abigail? Ah, good question. Um, so like I said, I'm a post-bachelor student, which means, yes, I will post the slides with my talk, which means that I'm only here at ISU for one year. So I've accepted a position in the master's program at New Mexico State University in the mathematical science department. So that is where I will be going next. What, what university did you say? I didn't hear it. New Mexico State. Oh, New Mexico, okay. Would be cool if we could play with those knots in browser. There is a tool and I can't, I've, I've got to figure out what it's called, but there is a tool somewhere. I think it's through GeoGebra. Um, that allows you to draw any squiggle and it will turn it into an alternating knot that you can play with. So you can't make every knot, but you can make some of them. The knot zoo, I'm gonna write that down. Uh, how did I decide on the projections? Well, that's, that's also a good question. So, um, my first step with every one of them was to draw it on a whiteboard and, and start figuring out like, okay, what happens if I extend this edge? What happens if I extend that one? Um, and then I would prototype them out of copper because I had a, about two pounds of copper wire. And so I would, I would play with that until I had a shape that I liked and then I would turn it into silver, which is much stiffer and, and hard, easier to make mistakes in, but harder to mess up once you've made a decision. And the silver to me looked like it had a, like a square cross section. Oh, so that depends on which one. So let me pull I was back. wondering if you were intentional about making some of them into listing strips by how you glue the ends back together. So for the record, if I had been, they would have been strictly speaking umbilic umbilical toruses yeah. and not listing strips. Um, but no, I was not. I was really intentional about trying to ding up the metal with my pliers as little as possible. Uh, and that was my primary concern. But some of them have a square cross section, like you said, and then others have a half round cross section. Uh, let me get back to it, an easy one to tell. So I think this is probably, this is the easiest one to tell on. So if you look at the, the one on the right, you can see that the inside surface is very flat and the outside surface is rounded. Um, these ones I was intentional about keeping the flat flat and the round round so that it would connect up evenly at the at the end. Um, but the, the square wire was really good for bigger sculptures because it's quite rigid. Uh, it was a little bit thicker. This is actually the half round is actually a higher gauge than the, the square wire but weighs about a third as much still. Um, so it's much more flexible and I definitely melted a couple of pieces in the process. Thank you, this is beautiful. I especially love the, the sculpture in honor of your high school teacher. I think the, like the, the mathematical story as a metaphor, I think is really compelling as, a, as an art source. Thanks, I really appreciate that.
Anyone else have uh, things they want to share, questions they want to ask? It's for another talk sometime, but my I'm a musician. And so my my math and my or my interest in music feels very mathy to me. So we could we could chat some other time about that. We definitely should. I do have a question. Um yep. I don't know if I'm unmuted. I can hear yep. you. Okay, good. Um do you know offhand uh like one general connection between the bridges of Konisberg and knot theory? No, because I'm not a graph theorist any more than I am a knot theorist. <laughs> um, the, the general connection that I'm aware of is that they are both questions that can be solved with topology. Okay. Um, someone asked, what's my favorite thing that you should work on with students? I think you should have them tangle up balls of string, glue the ends together, and then try to decide uh, who accidentally made the same knot. And that's a good way to, to figure out um, the Reidmeister move. So how to untangle a knot and, and sort of think about comparing and have you untangled it as much as you can type of things. So I, I would give them some shoelaces and tell them to go wild and then make them figure it out. <laughs> I have been to the knitting circle at the joint math meetings. Those are a lot of fun. Um, I usually bring my beading. It's a, if anybody uh, is not uh, uh, familiar with that and goes to the joint meetings, uh, well, if they're in person again, uh, drop by the knitting circle. Uh, you don't have to be knitting, uh, but there'll be lots of people doing crafting and uh, uh, showing games and hobbies and all sorts of things. There's usually a lot of origami artists too. And if it's when once the pandemic is done enough, you can also rather than gluing the string, you can hold hands, right? That's a fun one for an icebreaker. <laughs> if it's safe to be within six feet of each other. I don't know if I'll ever again be comfortable enough to shake strangers' hands, but I'm not sure either. Maybe we'll be done with handshaking. Maybe everybody holds an end of a string. That gives you more flexibility, anyways. Other thoughts, questions, comments, strong feelings, concerns? Um, when I took a topology class and we're going over knot theory, we used these things that are like beads, but they had these parts that you can like, sort of snap off and then rearrange them. Ooh, do you know what they're called? No, uh, Terrell probably does though, because he, he was the one who taught the class and provided them. All right, I will have to find out. Um, another suggestion that I was actually given at one of those knitting circles was that um, bead crochet rope makes for really good knots because it's rigid enough that you can kind of see the form, but it's flexible enough that you can manipulate it quite a lot. So if you make a bunch of knots out of bead crochet, I have no idea how long that would take. I also just have all of these crocheted ropes that I put little like snaps on. And those have worked really well. And I'm planning on using those with my students this summer. And there are a lot of, they're, they're, they're not rigid. And what I like about what you have is that you were able to do rigid. And that's kind of why I was asking about the projections that you did. These are fun, but also terrible because once you've like made a knot and then you've messed around with it so much, it's sort of hard to figure out which knot you have again, but can be fun for like classes. But the snap is helpful. I will say like a lot of these sculptures are far enough away from the original like diagrams that come up if you Google it, that I've had to spend quite a lot of time just sitting down and reminding myself what knot they are. A, a good <laughs> half of the time preparing this presentation was checking to make sure that I had the right names on things. Since we're showing off things, I got this, which is two separate, well, it was just packaging for a blanket that somebody got me. Um, but there's, they're like uh, Velcro ends and it's double wrapped here. So you can see what would happen if you were to cut a listing strip in half. 
And mm -hmm. you can say so you can actually count the number of twists that it has. Because for many years, I thought it would be uh, a different number than it is. <laughs> and so this helped me check. Yeah, so I'll write down the name. The name for the like a generalization of if you twist the strip n times is, is a paradromic ring. And I could not find a lot of information on them, but but you can twist it more times and, mm -hmm. and have interesting okay. properties appear. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been lovely. Can you uh, can you show us your, your last piece of art one more time? I'd like to see it again before we yes, go. Yes, definitely do that. Skip the galaxies. Ta-da. <laughs> Excellent, so beautiful. Um, Tian, before we go, can you give us a foreshadow about uh, what's going to happen next week? Um, sure. So, um, the, so this year, my collaborator, uh, Dr. Laura Stoll from Fort Lewis College, and I have been working together on a CURM undergraduate research grant, and uh, we've been looking at. Uh, a discrete version of homotopy for graphs. And that's what my students are, all, both of our students have been working on and they will be presenting what they've done next week. Excellent. Lovely. And then can everybody unmute and join me in thanking Abigail for a wonderful talk and for, for sharing such wonderful art.